G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so good to see you. I do hope that you are super well. Today, I want to talk about a really interesting interview with the head of UX for the Nikon Imaging Business Unit. This interview is with Phototrend and was recently conducted at CP+. So this is all new information. This interview touches on a lot of interesting topics, including will Nikon make a high-end APS-C camera? The question is asked. What can we expect for future firmware updates? The fact that Nikon actually not only make their own lenses, but they actually make the glass for their lenses, which Nikon state they are the only camera and lens company that actually make their own glass. And this is a significant advantage. We are gonna pan for the nuggets of gold within the fertile ground of this interview. Join me. Let's start with the fact that Nikon make their own lenses, but not only do they make their own lenses, but they make, they actually manufacture the glass within the lenses. And Nikon state themselves that they are the only camera and lens company to do this. Now, perhaps Sigma may well grind and make their own glass, but I think it's safe to say we don't really consider them a camera company as well. Even so, they've made a few cameras they are not making cameras like Sony, Canon, and Nikon are. And thus, this is a really interesting industry advantage, the fact that you can make your own glass from the glass stage. And as is stated in this interview, Nikon continue to upgrade the materials and the coatings and how they create this glass, bringing us, and I think it's safe to say after the last few years, absolutely class leading optics. And of course, the latest lenses that we've seen, the Plena 135 and the 600mm 6.3. Both of these lenses far exceed expectations from my perspective. And having worked with F-Glass for over 20 years, I can absolutely say unequivocally that we have had a major step in quality across the full range of Nikon lenses. So what does this mean for Nikon's competition? If we're to take this statement on face value, and I have no reason not to, Canon don't actually make the glass in their lenses. Sony don't actually make the glass in their lenses. They order it from somewhere and then they go from there. Now, I have a video in the works that's been in the works now for something like almost six months, and it's based on my visit to the Nikon Museum in Japan. And why that video has not been released yet is I'm doing a great deal of research around two things. The fact that Nikon make lithography machines, which make sensors, computer chips, and so much more. Nikon make these machines, and they are making modern versions of these machines. And the second part of this story is Nikon make their own glass. And that's very clear because when you walk into the museum, you see this enormous ingot, which is probably about that big with an enormous circumference. And from there, lenses are made for all sorts of use cases, including lithography machines, and of course, including camera lenses. And out of my research, I can see that Nikon make lenses four different ways. And thus, what does this mean for Nikon's competition? Well, Nikon own the companies that make this glass. They are subsidiaries of Nikon. I suppose ultimately what it means is they can be ahead of the pack and they can have the very best glass, the very best, the latest in innovations, ASAP. This also means, and part of my research I have seen this, that Nikon sell optical glass to third parties. And again, that might be for all sorts of things, lithography machines, telescopes, microscopes, but I suspect it includes lenses as well. Now, of course, we would understand that Nikon has relationships with companies like Sigma and companies like Tamron. And we know companies like Tamron, well, they make lenses for Sony and they make lenses for Nikon and they've made lenses for other manufacturers as well. It is possible that a Nikon owned subsidiary, that glass ends up in lenses for other camera manufacturers. I think it's really exciting that Nikon have publicly stated this because it makes it very clear that they certainly have an advantage when it comes to 
optical design. And another part of this equation is, of course, the Z mount. The Z mount by sheer physics is the most flexible mount that we have. Coupling that with state-of-the-art lens design and having the best mount, I certainly think, like I've talked many times before, we are gonna continue to see optical brilliance and the exotics next from Nikon. Very exciting times ahead. In this interview, it's also stated when it's asked, will there be a new roadmap, a new lens roadmap? The current plan moving forward is that Nikon now want to surprise us with the lenses that come next. Now, that's both very exciting and very frustrating at the same time, but I get it. We are very much now in the exotic phase. And to telegraph to your competition what is the next brilliant lens that you're going to do, well, that is actually a commercial disadvantage. We have everything that we need to shoot and get the job done. We absolutely do. Of course, we'd like a few wider primes, but beyond that, we really have everything. So to be surprised by the exotics that are made from this brilliant glass that works on this astonishing Z mount, I think we're in a really exciting spot, but we're not gonna be able to enjoy the roadmap moving forwards. Where's the 35 1.2? Who knows? So when it comes to the question around APS-C and will there be a high-end APS-C camera, I think this answer is ridiculously interesting and it sounds extraordinarily positive to me for those that are looking for a high-end APS-C camera. And the answer is this, they have created a robust presence in this space with the D7500 and the D500. So there's a customer base there, people that are looking for this sort of camera for enthusiasts or perhaps content creators, YouTubers, TikTokers, and so on, that they want high quality APS-C products for hybrid use, video, and for stills. But of course, APS-C is cheaper than full frame. So what we're getting from this answer is, we know there's a market from the past with the D7500 and the D500, and they know that there's a market now with your hybrid content creators, your YouTubers, your TikTokers. If you are acknowledging that there are two markets for your product that they could potentially go into, I think you're acknowledging that there's a market and you're gonna be looking towards it. And ultimately the quote ends this way. And of course it's translated from French, but I think it's pretty telling. We must continue to work on this subject to be able to meet the demands of this generation. So from my perspective, if they're gonna to continue to work on it to meet the demands, well, QED. I think the question was around high-end APS-C and the answer is we're continuing to work on it. Very exciting for those users looking for a high-end APS-C camera, timeline-wise unknown. My guess is if it's being actually talked about publicly in this way, maybe it's not too far away. A year or two? Something like that? Maybe. Who knows? But I don't think it would be being telegraphed if it was three or four years away. Also, when it comes to this particular one, their biggest competitors, Fuji, Canon and Sony, and they've all got pretty good offerings in APS-C, let's face it. So yeah, Nikon, bring it on. I think it's time. Another really interesting thing about this interview is how firmware is being created. There's been so many minor and smaller updates and additions, and many of those are asked for by customers because I get them in my comments all the time. But reading between the lines here, my thought is we're going to continue to get additions of things that we saw in F cameras, additions of things that we're seeing in cameras in general, both other brands of cameras and things that we find in mobile phones. All these things are going to be added along with brand new ideas. I think every now and again, there will be some innovative new ideas, things that we just have never thought of. My guess is we are living now where these cameras are computers with sensors at the front of them, the shutter's gone, the mirror's gone, and so they can actually behave and do things in completely different ways. It opens up new opportunities and it opens up new thinking. This is a great opportunity for us to put on our lateral thinking hats and put down here in the very comments below, what some crazy ideas of what we could do with these astonishing machines. So please, if you have some ideas, share it in the comments below. It's also stated in this interview around firmware that of course, firmware has its limits, 
and hardware and sensor ultimately drive and stipulate what is possible, which is something that I've talked about in the past. There are limits to what's achievable. And of course, this continues to beg the question, will we see any more speed out of a Z9? No idea. Talk of a next firmware update for the Z9. There's no talk of it here in this interview. I do have one thought that you can pin, which is this. The Z8 now has pixel shift, the Z9 does not. My belief is the Z9 will have pixel shift because this is the sort of technology that most definitely should be in a flagship camera. And thus, we will be getting another firmware update. Will it be just pixel shift? I doubt it. We will see, time will tell. The firmware developers are now much closer to customers, customers' views and reviews. And because of that, they are now able to respond quicker. And that is very exciting. So for example, it's stated here, if a request is related to the user interface, for example, we can quickly implement it and then incorporate these changes into the camera via a firmware update. This is how we judge whether we should wait for the next model or if we can incorporate the change into a firmware update. In addition, by listening carefully to customers, we often discover new things that we had never noticed. We learn a lot from these discoveries and begin to work on areas that we had not paid attention to before. That's super interesting to me. The bottom line is here, Nikon are openly stating, we have capacity to bring ideas to the table that maybe they haven't considered. And again, if it's possible, they will consider it. And that to me is so exciting. And because Z9, Z8 are simply a computer with a sensor on the front of it, sky's the limit to a certain extent. And finally, a really interesting statement around full frame lenses for Z mount. And we'll just touch on Canon as well. So there was an interview with Photo Trend with the head of Sigma, and he could make no statement around Sigma and RF. But what he did say is they are very interested in making full frame lenses for Z, and the only way that they can work out whether they'll be successful or popular is, well, yes, they would have to make some. So that is a hint that Sigma are interested in making full frame lenses for Z mount. I don't think companies telegraph this sort of thing very far in advance. I have a feeling we might see something full frame from Sigma, let's say sometime this year at best, something like that. But we can certainly say from this comment that they want to put their toe in the water and see how Nikon users would react to Nikon Z glass. That is what we can take from this. Also, when it comes to third party glass, they are happy to see lenses from companies like Viltrox, Seven Artisans and so on, because they want to see their customers having a very wide and broad range of lenses to choose from. Again, that means to me that Nikon is embracing third party. And of course, we are just seeing so many third party lenses. I've got another two or three coming to me very soon. And I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon because we know the Z8, Z9, ZF have all been extraordinarily successful cameras. All right, well, I think this is a really interesting interview when it came to the APS-C camera, further firmware updates, the fact that Nikon make their own glass. I think there's a whole story there. Whether I expand my Nikon museum visit to include that, I'm not sure. There's a great deal to talk about there but I do want to get that video out eventually. And I'm also wanting to talk about the lithography machine side of things as well, which is also very complicated. And it's also very difficult to find out information about what the industry does. All of this stuff is very protected information, which I respect and understand. You just have to do a lot of research. There is information out there. Anyway, I'd love to know your thoughts and your interpretation on all of this. I thoroughly recommend going to read that article and you can take your own thoughts from it and I'd love you to share those thoughts back with us in the comments below. I will put a link to that article in the show notes. Thank you so much everybody for being here. I do look forward to your thoughts when it comes to firmware, lenses, high-end APS-C bodies and so much more.
It's been so good to see you. And if this is your first time here, I would love to see you again. So please do subscribe, please share, and please like. All right, bye for now.